Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar today. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm your host for today's webinar. Our topic is Brian's investment journey from zero to 500 apartments in a few months. Many of you might already know me, but some of you who do not know me, my name is Vinky Lumba. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Lumba Investment Group. I have a very strong IT and academia background. I have a multiple years of corporate America and academia experience as a business leader and as a professor at California State University. At current, I'm in commercial real estate investing space with special focus on multifamily investing. I have done some commercial retail brokerage as well with my W2. I'm always looking for investor partners. I would love to connect, help and educate people on real estate investing and passive income or mailbox money. I host and facilitate educational webinars every other week on Fridays and bring some interesting topics on real estate, multifamily investing and syndication with some great guests who are subject matter experts in that field. Before we get started, we would like to go through some of the housekeeping items. Please use the Q&A box for any questions instead of the chat box because questions tend to get lost in the chat box. Uh, we'll try to address all the questions after the presentation. If we did not get to your question for some more reason, please send an email to winky at lumbainvest.com and we'll provide you with the answers. This webinar will be recorded and recordings will be sent out to all. Recordings will come from winky at lumbainvest.com. To avoid emails end up in your spam or promotions folder, please whitelist my email or in other words, add me to your contact list. A small little disclaimer before we get started. Uh, this webinar is strictly for educational purposes and should not be considered as a legal accounting or investment advice. This webinar does not represent an offer to sell or solicitation of an offer to purchase an investment or security. The strategies mentioned in the presentation may not be applicable for everyone. The information presented is believed to be accurate and reliable. We make no representation or warranties expressed or implied as the accuracy of such information and we explicitly disclaim any and all liability that may be based on such information and or errors or omissions thereof. Please consult with your own attorney, financial advisor and CPA for all legal matters, investments and specific tax situations. This is strictly a knowledge sharing and for educational purposes only. How to reach me, if you're not already connected, please uh, try to connect with me via social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Insta. And uh, you can go to my website, uh, www.lumbainvest.com and download a free ebook, Seven Reasons Why Real Estate Syndication Build a Long-Term Wealth. Now a little bit about our special guest, Brian Brisco today. Brian went from zero to 500 apartments in 24 months. Today, he will share about how he took his previous work and life experience and adapted to multifamily investing. Brian is a co-founder of multifamily investing firm, Four Oaks Capital, which currently controls 485 units and $21 million in asset under management. He is also the host of Diary, of an apartment investor podcast where he brings an experienced and an aspiring investor together on each episode. He's an active duty Marine Lieutenant Colonel stationed at the Pentagon and will retire in 2021 after 20 years of service. Congratulations, Brian, and welcome to our webinar today. Much. Thank you, Inky. Appreciate it. Um, so, so one, one cat or one note on that one, um, yesterday was my last day working at the Pentagon. So, um, Hi. I still have uh, a little bit of time till I'm officially retired. Um, but for all intents and purposes, you know, my, my 20 year career is, is over. So I just introduction to, to myself. I, I was born and raised in the Salt Lake city area. Um, lived there until I was about uh, 24, you know, except for, I, I did a two-year mission for my church in Chile, and that was uh, an eye-opening experience for me, you know, to, to say the least. But, uh, you know, at age 24, um, I was a graduate student in the math program at the University of Utah, and I wanted to be a math professor. And 
we really, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a math professor, to be honest with you. I don't think any, you know, I think I spent the large part of my adult life trying to figure what I wanted to be when I grow up. Um, and I, incidentally, I finally found the answer and that's commercial real estate. But um, I remember once at, at a department picnic um, and I, I did share this at a meetup last night. So some of you guys are going to hear this twice, but I remember once at a department picnic, you know, looking around the, the people who were there and it was probably the most socially awkward scene I have ever seen, you know, just a uh, bunch of men and, and women who were absolutely brilliant, but just their, their social skills were, were extremely lacking. And, um, I realized that if I did the same thing as they have done, I'll end up being like they are, you know, and that, that kind of scared me. Um, long story short, that led me to the, the Marine Corps Reserves. And I figured that would be something that could, you know, help me to develop other areas of my life besides my brain, you know, um, which, you know, getting a PhD in math is, is a lot of, a lot of exercise for your brain, but there's, there's a lot of more, a lot more aspects. Um, little did I know that, uh, you know, shortly after getting out of basic training, um, you know, there, there'd be a terrorist attacks on the Pentagon and, and World Trade Center. So um, ended up uh, going, volunteering to go active duty. Um, I remember my, my reserve unit was saying, we don't know when we're going to get called up, but we're expecting to get called up. Um, and they eventually did get called up and they ended, ended up doing, you know, two, two tours in, in Iraq. But uh, um, I decided that I, I would take things into my own hands and go active duty. I, I've been active duty ever since. So, um, you know, 20, 20 years, a uh, long time coming. And uh, like I said, you know, yesterday after, after a three-year tour in the Pentagon, I walked out of the Pentagon and, um, you know, I, I, I'll probably have to go back in once or twice as, as the final checkout before I'm actually fully retired. But uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, I, I don't really work for the Marine Corps anymore, which is interesting. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's sunk in yet. But um, about the, the real estate story, you know, I'll say something that's very cliche. And, you know, I'm at a buddy's house here who's a senior executive, one of the, one of the founding members of, of Sabal, one of the nation's lenders. Um, but a uh, big, big multifamily lender. I think they do by volume 20% of Freddie Mac loans in, in the nation. But uh, um, he's just said the same thing to me, you know, what, what started his, you know, gears turning on, you know, finance and, and, and money and wealth was the purple Bible. A lot of people call it, or, you know, rich dad, poor dad. You know, I, I read that on a boat between Okinawa, Japan, where I was stationed and um, Subic Bay in the Philippines. You know, we were on a boat, we were going down there for an exercise and I had that book with me and I probably read it three times, you know, um, in, in that, that short time. And it just re I really caught fire. And I started realizing um, that there was another way besides just getting a paycheck. You know, that, that's what my dad did. My dad's living on a pension right now. Um, and that's the route that, that I was in at the time was, you know, military, you serve your time, you get a pension. But I started realizing that there's other ways to build wealth. Um, unfortunately, you know, when I read that book, you know, he, he gives, he talks about a lot of the things that he did, you know, including investing in, in stocks and businesses and, you know, different startups and commercial real estate of all things. But I looked at all that stuff and said, that sounds too difficult. Um, but at least I started, I started buying single family homes, you know, and it was, I would move somewhere when I, when I got transferred, I would buy a single family home. And when I moved out to the next duty station, I would turn it into a rental and buy something new. So that was the plan I made after re reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, looking back, I wish I would have been a little more aggressive, but uh, that, that's what I figured I could do. Um, you know, fast forward several years, a couple of years ago, um, you know, I'm sitting on three properties and thinking, man, you know, it's, it's nice. I've, I've got a little bit of equity. I've got a, you know, um, 90% of my net worth or we're sitting in those, those investment properties. Um, and I, I was trying to be able to scale that. And what, what I really ended up coming to is, was multifamily, you know, um, single family. There, there's, there's a lot of people who make a lot of money in the single family business. 
Um, but there's just so many things about multifamily, about apartments that, uh, that really appealed to me. And um, just, just to name a, a couple is the fact that you can raise the value of the apartments by raising the income. You know, that's not true in single family. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today um, at the networking event that I run that basically said, you know, I, I bought a couple of single family homes or maybe it was a duplex. I don't remember and put a lot of money into it, almost doubled the rents and the value of the property didn't go up, you know, and that's, that's not true in, in apartments. You know, you can really force that appreciation. You can force the value of the property upwards by being more efficient with your expenses and by um, raising, do, doing the renovations and doing whatever you need to do to make make the rent prices go up, you know, and I'm not talking about you know, just being unscrupulous and raising everybody's rents because that always backfires. But, okay. you know, we typically stray or stick with like a value add model where we're going in and we're making, um, making the apartments better. You know, we're, we're improving curb appeal. We're, you know, doing the landscaping. Um, in one case there, there's a, a building that we're under contract in right now. Um, I'm actually going to go visit it tomorrow, but not Monday, excuse me, but I haven't been there yet. But my, my um, partner said that my Honda Pilot would probably be swallowed up by some of the potholes in that, in that parking lot, you know? So you know, we go in and we're, we're going, we, we've got a line item on our um, uh, capital sheet that is, is dedicated to, to that parking lot. So we, we make apartment communities better. And by making it a better place, we can charge more rents and, the value is going to go up. And that really appealed to me, the, the fact that we can control the, the price of the property by controlling that, that net operating income. Um, and the other thing is just the, the natural ability to scale. You know, so instead of, you know, to own 20 doors of single family, you've got to make, you know, 20 purchases, get 20 loans. Uh, I mean, it is possible to get a portfolio and there, there's other ways of doing it. Yes. But you know, we're, we're purchasing 144 units um, right now, and it's a single loan. And, you know, the loan process is not much more difficult than a loan on a single family. In some aspects, it's actually easier. But uh, um, because they're, they're underwriting the property, they're not underwriting you, you know. So um, for a lot of the loans we've done, I haven't even had to turn in tax statements or bank statements, you know. It's just like they underwrite the property and they they ask me what my net worth is. And I'm like, we're, we're good. So, you know, we, we put all the assets we own on a piece of paper and send it into them. And they're like, yeah, you got the loan. But uh, so, so those things really appealed to me. And I, I started putting a lot of effort into learning the business. Um, and what I, what I started realizing and, I, and what I kind of wanted to focus on was um, I, I had no experience, you know, whatsoever in multifamily. But, you know, I had some in single family and that kind of translates, but not really. Um, but what, what I did have is almost 20 years of leadership and management experience, you know, in, in the Marine Corps, you know, so. Um, starting in 2002, when I when I commissioned, I've always been in charge of Marines and equipment. You know, been in charge of the maintenance of the equipment and everything else, and making sure, you know, things are done properly. You know, several combat deployments in leadership roles, and and what that means is, you know, for six or eight months prior to the deployment, you're you're training and you're getting the the Marines ready to deploy. You're making sure that everybody can do exactly what they're supposed to do in a combat situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was able to very much use that, that experience to be able to bring a team together and to be able to basically um, get our first couple of deals across the finish line, you know? So, um, and then, then looking at, at my partners, um, I have, there were four of us that, that uh, founded the company, hence the name Four Oaks Capital instead of three, five, or seven. But uh, um, four of us that started the company, each one of us did the same thing. You know, we, we all had different experiences and we leveraged our experiences um, to help translate, you know, what we did in a different field into multifamily. Um, Eric Shirley, who is our acquisitions director right now, um, used to be a medical device salesman. Mm -hmm. All right. And 
does that really directly translate to multifamily? Mm, not really, but his service area were the Carolinas. And we have now seven properties with the eighth under contract in South Carolina. Um, the one property we don't have in the Carolinas is in Georgia, and it's across the river, you know, from um, South Carolina. So it's right on the border between the two. You know, the way he was able to leverage his, his skills is he was essentially traveling all over the Carolinas to meet with doctors and, you know, peddle his wares, essentially. But his company would, would pay for him to travel and oftentimes, you know, put him up in a hotel and, you know, he'd just go from you know, one city to the next. He was able to look at markets. You know, he was able to, to do his day job. And then, you know, when he was done, you know, sometimes at three o'clock, um, start touring properties, start driving neighborhoods, start, you know, looking around and seeing where are the good places to buy, where, 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 are, the place, where are the places that are getting better? You know, where is the path of progress in these cities? And he has a, a very intimate knowledge of a lot of the, the cities in South Carolina. Um, not to mention, he grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and went to college in Charleston. So, so when you look at, you know, his experience and how he translated that to, to multifamily, you know, he, he was a natural, um, a natural acquisitions guy because he knows a lot of these areas like the back of his hand. You know, he's, he's, he's flown into that Greenville Spartanburg Air Airport, you know, probably hundreds of times over the last 10 or 15 years, you know. So, um, so he was able to leverage that experience. Um, to be able to uh, become an acquisitions director. Um, he also has a business degree and, you know, he's really good with numbers, which very much helps with, uh, helps as a uh, acquisitions guy. And speaking of uh, the numbers, one thing I, I forgot to say when I, when I was talking about me was I have two math degrees, you know, so when we started out, um, I was leveraging my math experience to be able to underwrite. Um, a lot of people, I like to use the matrix example. All right. If you've ever seen the matrix, I know it's like a 20, 25 year old movie, but I think most people in this, okay, looking at the people that I do know in this group, you guys all know that movie, but, uh, in the matrix, they have ones and zeros just scrolling down the screen, you know, green numbers on kind of a blackish background and, you know, Keanu Reeves, I don't remember his name in the movie can look into there. Once he's, once he's trained, he can look in there and see things. That's me on spreadsheets, you know, because of my math background, um, when I dive into the numbers, I start seeing patterns and I was able to leverage that to be able to, you know, and, and bring that skill to the table to be able to underwrite properties, to look over financials and see things that other people may have missed. And, you know, not just look at the numbers, but look for the patterns in the numbers. Um, so you know, taking that, bringing that to the table, that was one of my strong points. And I was able to leverage that. Um, another one of our, the founding members, Todd Butler, was a senior executive for uh, a consulting firm that did a half a billion dollars in revenue every year. You know, so he knew business. He, he knew how companies operate and work. And the other thing is, you know, since he was a senior executive, you know, he rubbed shoulders with a lot of senior executives at his company and a lot of senior executives with the companies that they worked with. They're a consulting firm, right? So um, he was able to help in several ways. He's our asset manager right now, um, but he's also able been, been able to raise a whole lot of money for our deals. Um, and, and Brian Mallon is honestly good at everything. You know, I, I, I haven't found a chink in his armor yet. But, uh, you know, he was also, he was an oil and gas industry and uh, basically in, in the sales. So he, he would sell, worked for a company that made devices that you, you need to pull oil and gas out of the ground. I don't know a lot about it, but, uh, you know, he, he brings um, all his skills to the table as well. He's, he's a smooth talker. Um, you know, he, he could probably sell an Eskimo, a block of ice if he had to. But, uh, um, so we were all able to leverage the skills that we had to, to come together and, and try to get a, a, the first deal, you know, past the finish line. And 
I, I will say that that the fact that we before that we were all just four guys that were kind of you know plugging uh, plugging along by ourselves, trying to get things done by ourselves. But um, when we came together, it's it's not um, it's not a coincidence that we got our first deal under contract after we decided to team up. All right, because prior to that moment, you know, I was talking to brokers, you know, about I, I, I. And this is a team sport. Brokers know it's a team sport. And what I didn't, I didn't realize it at the time. But when I was calling the brokers and say, hey, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that, you know, that was probably a red flag popping up right there saying, I, huh? So do you have a team? Oh, no, I don't. But, you know, I, I've got people that I network with and I can probably find people to partner with me. And I thought that was a suitable answer. But, you know, in, in a broker's mind, who knows exactly what you need to get a property under contract? Um, I mean, that was probably red flag and just like, all right, I'm going to put him in bucket B, you know, not, not on the A list, you know, he's going to be on the B list or maybe even the C list. But, uh, um, like I said, not a coincidence that, you know, when the four of us decided to join forces um, and it wasn't like we joined and said, Hey, let's, let's create a company together. It was, we were all looking to do the exact same thing. So we all came together and said, let's try to get a property under contract together. Um, incidentally, we sent a couple of LOIs in with, you know, um, three different company logos on it, you know, so um, Brian Mellon and Eric had, had partnered slightly just, just before the, the four of us all came together. So they had one logo between them, but um, we, we sent a couple of, lo of LOIs in with four different company logos on it, you know, and not, not that that's a bad thing, but uh, um, it, it's actually, I think it's a, it's a smart thing if, if you're trying to get your first deal under, under contract. But uh, um, so our, our first deal and I, I really like how this came together. You know, it's, it's, um, I live in just outside the DC area. Um, you know, right now I'm in Annapolis, but uh, still just outside the DC area. But, um, my target market was, was South Carolina. And I remember calling brokers and calling brokers. And I wasn't getting a lot of traction, you know, and I decided that I need to do something different. I need to do something to get their attention. And I just took a, a week off, you know, went and talked to my boss and said, hey, I'm going to take, uh, you know, the following week off. And he said, all right, no problem. Um, got in my car and I drove down to South Carolina. Eight hour drive, not too far. Um, fortunately, my wife was, was born and raised just outside of Columbia. And I was able to, to stay with her aunt and uncle who, I mean, I, I know them very well. They, they've stayed at our house several times when they've um, come visited. But uh, so just very natural, went down and, and visited them and um, tried to line a week up with as many brokers as I could. And, you know, I probably made a, like two or three dozen phone calls to brokers trying to get a few minutes of their time. And after a few dozen phone calls to every brokerage that I could Google that was in, you know, Columbia or Greenville, South Carolina, I had two, you know, and part of me was thinking, should I just not go? I'm like, no, I'm going to go anyway. I'm still going to go. I had convinced two brokers to spend some time with me. Um, one broker was going to show me a property and I thought, okay, great. So I went down, met one broker one broker for coffee and you know that was it um met another broker at a property it was a 72 unit b class asset in greater south carolina um about a mile from that big bmw plant you know and uh really pretty property and um the numbers all worked except for one thing you know it you had to assume the loan it was a fairly new loan and the the, the previous or the, the owner on it at the time had a, a large prepayment penalty um, and it just didn't pencil for us. We, we underwrote it and with, with, the, with the loan assumption, we couldn't make it work. Um, but while I was down there, you know, I was with two brokers, um, a woman named Kay and a guy named Alex. I remember Alex said, hey, Brian, we, we just signed an agreement with an owner on uh, another property a couple miles from here. We haven't even looked at the financials yet, but if you want, we can go see it. And I said, yeah, absolutely, sure. 
I, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I just thought, you know what, more properties is good. And end of the day, that ended up being the first property that we closed on, you know, it, City View Apartments in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, you know, so, you know, a lot, a lot of that had to do with, you know, take, taking the action that, that I took, you know, going out on a limb and heading down and sitting down with brokers and um, just, just touring the properties. Um, it, was, it was probably a month, month and a half after that we, we finally got it under contract. We, we pushed prices back and forth a lot. Um, and we were extremely lucky and extremely fortunate because um, right after they, you know, right after they showed it to us, um, the, the broker said the owner told him to stop marketing it because he, he was having um, second thoughts about selling. Right. And so why that was fortunate for us is we were the only people that knew about it. And I was talking to the broker, I'm like, does that mean he doesn't want to sell? And, and the broker and, you know, pretty, pretty smart of him to say so. They just said, if you want to buy it, give us an offer. I'm like, all right, sounds good. So, you know, we, we, we sharpened our pencil, we put an offer in, you know, and they, they countered and, um, you know, in, in retrospect, if there was anybody else in the deal, we wouldn't have gotten this because it took us a week to answer their counter. You know, and we put in another offer and they countered again and, you know, it took us probably another week um, to, to answer their, their counter. Um, when we finally got under contract, I, I, was in, I was in Lima, Peru when we sent in one counter offer. My, my job's international affairs. My job was international affairs. Um, and I was in Bogota, Colombia when we got it under contract, you know, so trying to do deals, not only from DC and nights and weekends, but, uh, you know, from, from South America as well. But any, anyway, we, we got it under contract, we, we got it closed and um, learned a lot from it. But, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about the law of the first deal. And it was, um, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back a little bit and, and talk about something else that I, I sorry, I had in my notes that, uh, um, that I missed. Um, you know, we're, we're syndicating, you know, we're trying to syndicate. And I assume most people know what that means. But if not, you know, we're basically raising money from people who want to invest mm -hmm. in real estate. And so, you know, I have a lot of, my, my partners all had a lot of experience in other areas that weren't commercial real estate. And, you know, each one of us came to the independent conclusion that, you know, we were nervous about taking out people's money, you know, and um, so what did we do? Well, um, between the four founding members, you know, there were two Michael Blanc coaching students and a Rod Chief coaching student. So each of us independently, several months before we met, had, had all decided to do some coaching to, to help get that, that knowledge, to help be able to, um, to answer the questions that, that we would inevitably get. And in those, in those you know, coaching programs, we all had mentors. You know? So three different mentors that were leading us and guiding us through it. And um, one of the mentors partnered with us on the deal. So, you know, it was, it was something that, that we knew that we needed. We were worried about, you know, we were worried about our fiduciary responsibility um, to the investors. And so, I mean, between, between the, the four of us, you know, we've probably put six figures into different educational programs and coaching and everything else, you know, to, to be able to, to mitigate that risk for, for any potential investors. Um, and then once again, we, we brought in experienced people on the deals that we have done, once again, to be able to mitigate the risk and to leverage their experience. So, um, and it was something that was extremely beneficial to us, you know, um, to be able to have, you know, somebody with 3000 units and who's been in the business for um, over a dozen years, you know, on our team and on all the calls and. Um, to be able to, to guide us through the, 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 the things that we really didn't know well. So you know, that, was, uh, that was something that, like, like I said, was, was extremely beneficial for us um, and, and really gave us the confidence to be able to move forward. Um, but we got that first deal under contract and 
I'm going to remind you of what, what I said a couple of minutes ago. You know, when I went to South Carolina on that road trip, I called dozens of brokers. All right. One of the brokers that I met with um, sat down. He said he would give me 15 minutes of his time. Actually, three bro I, I ended up spending time with three brokers. I think I said two earlier, three brokers. Um, I forgot about Brooks. But uh, one of the brokers that sat down with me said he'd give me 15 minutes. And I met him in the conference room of his office. He didn't want to meet me for coffee. He didn't want me to meet, meet me for lunch. Um, I realized why later he didn't want to spend the time with me, but he gave me 15 minutes and it was like 20 questions. And when we were done talking, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we'll email you some things and whatnot. And, you know, as soon as that 15 minutes was up, he stood up, shook hands and all right, we'll see you later. He didn't answer my emails. When I, when I emailed him, he wouldn't answer the emails, you know, I never got, he, he said he was going to email me some, some of the, the live deals they had and never did. And I emailed him and I asked about it. I emailed his, his junior partner and asked about it. I didn't get a single response. All right. And I realized later it's, it's just the, the, the brokers, you know, the brokers are looking for viable buyers and he didn't see me as a viable buyer. Um, another broker that I called, um, this particular broker was out of Greenville and he said, I don't give time. I get 20 calls like this a week from people who want to buy apartments. He's like, I spend my time with people who own apartments because they are the ones that pay the commission and refuse to meet with me. So fast forward, we were about two or three weeks away from closing on our first property. And we started thinking, you know, we, we had completely stopped our acquisition mindset and acquisition mode. Um, and we decided that we needed to start that back up again. I emailed the, the first broker, you know, out of, out of the, uh, the one that, that I met with. And I said, hey, since we last talked in March, um, we got a $4 million property under contract. We've raised $1.8 million and we're closing in a couple of weeks. Do you have anything that we can look at for our next purchase? And guess what? He responded. All of a sudden, he started sending us some deals. So our second purchase was um, a deal that he sent us in, in Columbia, South Carolina. So that was deal number two. Um, deal number three, I'm looking at thinking my numbers. Deal number three came from the same brokerage that sold us deal number one. Deal number four, that broker that I called, he said, I only deal with owners. Guess what? Once we started, once we were owners, all of a sudden he took our call on, on a separate trip down, a trip down to South Carolina, you know, maybe six months after that first one, he had all four of us over to his office for lunch, paid, catered lunch for us. And you know, we came in, sat down at the big conference table, sat for an hour, hour and a half. And he has, he has brokered two deals for us. So out of, out of the eight we've closed, um, you know, two of them came from brokers that just weren't giving us the time of day. And when a lot of people talk about the law of the first deal, that, that's really, I think, what the trigger is. Once, once you've proved your ability to close on one, the brokers are going to give you more time. And that's, that's, that was really one of the keys for us was establishing that credibility, the ability to close on, on an asset. Um, so, you know, deal number two was, uh, uh, a section eight property, which is, is really, really interesting. Um, I don't know if we'll ever do a section eight property again, just because um, the housing authority is so slow and difficult to work with, but um, we, we purchased a 50 unit property at 22,000 in a door in an area where, where C-class was going at 50 to $60,000. Um, and, you know, it was, it was distressed. It really was. Um, so, you know, we, we've, we're all in right now at about 1.3 million and we have gotten unsolicited officer offers for that from brokers at 2.2 and 2.4, you know, so it's, it's something that, you know, we were able to buy right. We were able to, to try to take a challenge. You know, it was a challenge and it has been a challenge from day one, 
but you know, all in at 1.2. And, you know, if we refinanced right now, we cash everybody out and still have money left over, you know, so, um, infinite returns from, from here on out on that one. And we will refinance probably by the end of the year. Um, and it's just, it's just been a really, really fun ride so far. Just, I, I think working with partners and being able to, to leverage all of our other experiences and getting things across the table has, has been extremely beneficial for, for a lot of reasons. You know, I can work in areas that I'm strong in because my partners are strong in other areas. And between the four of us, you know, we had all the bases covered. Um, you just kind of run down the, the other deals. Um, the first one we, we closed on was actually two properties. It was a portfolio. Um, the third one was a section eight property. Um, deal number four was, was an interesting one. We did a COVID close. We, we got it under contract um, in November of 19. And it was a loan assumption. And the lender was taking, taking their sweet time. And by the time everything shut down for COVID, we still hadn't had an approval. Um, but uh, it ended up taking six months uh, to, to close on that property. Uh, we purchased it at 2.4 million and um, a property a little bit off the, the beaten path, but um, it had a lot of good dynamics. And I, I think this one, we were, we were very fortunate once again, because um, it, was, it was a property that because it was off the beaten path, not a lot of people were interested in. And we went, we walked it, we looked at the numbers, we compared it to the, everything, you know, within a couple of miles. And it was, it was a diamond in the rough. We paid 2.4 million. And interestingly, and I, I didn't realize this would happen, but we, we get brokers calling us all the time about properties we own. And they're like, hey, I've got a buyer that's interested in X property. Um, in the last two weeks, we got unsolicited offers at 4 million. I got an LOI in my inbox for 4 million sight unseen. We paid 2.4, you know, so um, a, lot of, a lot of that came from Eric. Eric knowing the areas extremely well. And so when, when something popped up that was off the beaten path, he was able to say, I know that area extremely well. You know, I, I've sold the doctors that are there. I've, I've driven that. I know it. And that has been one of the keys to what we've, we've been able to do. Um, so that one we, we, we purchased um, a year ago next week. And it's already, you know, now granted, we, we put $700,000 in CapEx into it. Um, and so that's, that's part of the reason that the price has, has gone up so much. Um, but the other part is, is we, we were able to negotiate the price because um, we were able to find an owner. The owner wanted to do a 1031 exchange mm -hmm. and he wanted to, have, if anybody knows about that, there's not a lot of flexibility with timelines on a 1031. So we basically wrote a contract with the owner that said, we will buy it anytime in the next six months. All right. And um we, we ended up being able to negotiate the price down low because of the flexibility we offered the seller. And end of the day, you know, right now, um, we're, we're above pro forma on, on the numbers um, and it, it's doing extremely well. Uh, another property we bought was, this was uh, one of the properties from the, from the broker that uh, only works with sellers, right? Um, if you remember him, um, this is, this is a, a fun one too. It's right next to Clemson university. Um, when I say right next to it, and we're talking two miles. All right. So a little too far to be student housing. Um, and you know, once again, this is, this is Eric and, and relationships, you know, he, he used to be a salesman and you're, um, you get good at sales by building relationships. And he had a really good relationship with this broker and this particular property was purchased by a company that was literally going to bulldoze it. All right. They were going to bulldoze it. They purchased it to put student housing up and they were going to do a class A student housing. It's 1970s vintage. And so they purchased it and the county put a moratorium up on new construction. So they couldn't build. 
And so the two years they owned it, they didn't put any capital expenses in. They told the property manager, I don't want you to lose money. All right. And when they, when they finally realized that they weren't going to be able to do the development project they wanted to do, they decided to go to a broker and try to sell it. We didn't know what price they wanted. The broker was giving no pricing guidance from the owners. We knew what they paid for it. Public, it, was, it was public record. We knew what they paid for it. And so we thought we would just lowball them and see what they came back with. Turns out they, they took the lowball offer. Um, we bought that property at 5.2 or 3.2. And, um, you know, right now it's probably worth, you know, five, five and a half million. Um, so, you know, one, once again, you know, credit to, to Eric Shirley for, for knowing the areas and doing homework, building the relationships. Um, another and, you guys were, and you guys were always at the right place at the right time. That's what I have to say. Right, at the right place at the right time. Exactly, that, yeah. Um, you know, and like, like I said, he, he, uh, he, started, um, he started to um, kind, of, kind of smile, but just brilliant move. He, started, he was able to control his own sales schedule, but he started to, to build his scale sales schedule around you know, what he wanted to do for commercial real estate. So um, he was still one of the leading salesmen for his company. Um, and it's, it's a nationwide company. He was still like one of the top, uh, top salesmen, but, uh, he started building his, uh, his medical device sales schedule around the properties he wanted to visit. Um, but, uh, another one that, that was a, an idea of where we saw something that other people didn't was, was our property in Augusta, uh, 167 units. And, I saw this, I had this email to me by um, somebody that I met at one of the local meetups and um, I immediately looked at it and said, no, all right. Why did I look at it and say no? Because the owner had a, a 12 year loan and he was two years into a term and it was a two year IO loan at 5.1%. You know, right now you, it was, it was, a Fannie or a Freddie, I don't remember which, um, but because it was a yield maintenance loan, his prepayment penalty was a seven figure prepayment penalty. So I looked at it at that immediately. I looked at that loan and said, no, you know, this is not going to be a good deal. You have to eat that loan and it's not going to be good. Eric looked at that and said, let me talk to these guys. All right. The property, when the previous owner purchased it two years ago, appraised at $8.4 million. We negotiated a $7.1 million purchase price. Mm -hmm. And right now that property, um, we estimate it's worth nine and a half, maybe low tens as, as far as what the, what the price is. And we've only begun our, our CapEx on it. Um, we have a $1.3 million capital expense budget and uh, we've only owned that for a couple of months, but to date, I think we spent about 60,000 of it, you know, so the, the big work hasn't even started yet. So when, when, when you look at, you know, what we've done, um, a lot of these properties we've been able to get because um, we've, we've, when I say we, I really mean Eric, knows the area so well, has been able to build the relationships with the brokers um, and in a lot of cases, be able to, to find something that other people will overlook. Um, the other two properties that I haven't talked about yet are actually really small. You know, we, we had decided that um, at one point that we weren't going to look any, at anything above 80 units. Um, and so we got one property at 80, one at 82, one at 167, and the one we have in our contracts, 144, but uh, a 28 unit about a half a mile from our Clemson property came up. And our Clemson property is 82 units and it has on-site management. And it's not quite, you know, it, it, it's in that gray zone where off-site management doesn't work and on-site management's too expensive. But uh, you know, we decided because we were doing a value add plan, because we're doing renovations, um, you know, we would have on-site management, but this property popped up 28 units, half a mile away. And we started thinking like, normally we wouldn't look at a 28 unit, but it's a half mile away. 
And now we have the on-site management from the 82 unit that's managing both properties mm -hmm. and it makes sense. The other one we purchased was a 40 unit and it's less than a half mile from our other 80 unit in a, in a neighboring town. So that's, that's basically the, the 500 units that we own right now. And um, we, we, just, uh, we, we just sent an email out to our investors. I got it right before logging on. I mean, I knew we were going to send it out, but uh, um, one of the properties, you know, we underwrote it and said, because of where it's at, we bought it at 70% occupancy. It's a, it's a Clemson one where the owner wasn't paying attention to it. We bought it at 70% occupancy. And because of the, the condition it was in, um, we told our investors, you know, up front, don't expect any cash year one. All right. Our number on our, our pro form on our pitch deck was a 1% return, which is, is not very good. But because of the potential, we were still able to get investors in. Um, we already have a net income of $55,000 and we, we close on that property. Um, it's been eight months. So we are actually going to make distributions um, coming soon on that property. Um, we, we just changed property managers right now. So once, once our accountant, you know, gets, gets our books set, um, we're going to, to make distributions on a property where we told our investors that, you know, you're, you're going to get probably 1% year one. So, um, anyway, a lot, a lot of, a lot of goodness has come from that, but, uh, you know, right now we, we have 144 unit under contract, um, in Florence, South Carolina. And like I said, I'm, I'm excited to get down and see it um, in, in a couple of days. And I'm also excited to not have to ask anybody permission, you know, um, to, to drive down to South Carolina to be able to see it. But uh, that, that's, that's a different story. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a short, sweet, you know, lay down of how we went from zero to 500. Um, and, you know, it, it's about it's been about 24 months. I mean, really, it, it really depends on when you want to start the stopwatch, you know, if that makes sense. I mean, do you want to start it when I, if you, if you start it when I started coaching, it's closer to three years. Um, if you start it when we got our first deal under contract, it's closer to two years, you know, but, uh, um, you know, depending on when you start the, when you start the watch, but uh, anyway, that's, that's the story of how we got there. And I, I think, you know, just, just recapping, you know, a couple of things that were important along the way was, was taking the skills that we had developed in our, our careers. And um, as of about a month ago, um, all the Four Oaks members are now in their 40s, in our 40s. Um, you know, our youngest member just hit 40 year old hood, you know. Um, so we can expect his midlife crisis to start pretty soon. He's probably going to buy himself a Ferrari and uh, um, not really, but uh, he jokes about it. Um, but uh, we were able to leverage our previous careers and, and bring the skills that we had developed in other careers to the table here. And, you know, make, we, we made up for the things that we lacked by partnering and, you know, by hiring. You know, none of us have a, a financial background. Our first hire was a CPA, you know, and we pay her well and she's, you know, doing a job that we couldn't do for ourselves, but in between coaching mentorship and, you know, pay to play education programs, um, we've been able to make up for the things that we've lacked. And um, anyway, that's, that's in a nutshell, how we went from zero to 500 units sure. in 24 months. That's an amazing story. I love it your team is a blend of different skill sets, you know, that makes you kind of stand out and take down the properties. And, and also you were able to leverage your previous skill set that you got in the leadership of so the management experience. Because it seems like you've been very persistent talking to the brokers, even though they didn't want to talk to you initially, you were persistent with your efforts. So you think that because of your experience or just being a Lieutenant Colonel, you know, your yeah. title, they were able to connect with you. You know, it's, it's interesting because I used to lead with, yeah, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps, but uh, most brokers, they're looking for people who can close on a loan, you know, and, and is Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps going to help me close on a loan? The answer is no. Um, in, in a lot of ways, that was more of a detriment to me than it was a help when I'm talking to other people because 
you know, if you look at investors, people want to invest with somebody who's really good at investments. You know, I spent the last 20 years, um, you know, part of my career trying to keep good airplanes in the sky and shoot bad airplanes down. I mean, that, that, that was my job. Um, doesn't translate very well to, to multifamily. That part of it doesn't, you know, but, uh, you know, when I, when I would talk to investors, people would remember me as the Marine, you know, not, 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 not necessarily Brian, the apartment investor, but Brian, the Marine Lieutenant Colonel. And it wasn't until I, I think I realized that I had to rebrand myself um, to be able to, to be, become more successful in this business. And there was a period of time where I took everything Marine Corps off of my LinkedIn por- profile. Um, I took it off Facebook. I took it off, you know, all of my profiles, you know, no, nowhere on any of my profiles would you see Brian the Marine. So somebody who didn't know me would look at my LinkedIn profile and see Brian the apartment investor, you know, and that's, that, that was something that uh, I, I've since gone back and added it in. And, you know, once I retire officially for sure, it's, 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 it's probably going to go up front, you know, for, for a couple of months, but, uh, um, you know, there, there's, there's certain things I learned that you can leverage. And then there, there's certain things that I learned that you have to not mention, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But the thing is, you had the mindset, mm-hmm. just being oh, yeah. a Marine Corps, because you had the mindset, kind of go get a mindset. It wasn't like, oh, I'm not going to stop no matter what, because I've seen that, you know, I've shot the planes in the air. Yeah. So just getting the multifamily down, it's not a big deal kind of thing. Yeah, that, that part, I mean, we, we always tell ourselves mission accomplishment. That is the number one thing. We are going to accomplish the mission. And in my line of work, you know, in, as an active duty Marine, sometimes that means people don't come home, you know, and that's, that's why it's number one um, is we, we have a mission. We have to do it. There's, there's risks involved. We mitigate the risks the best we can, which is something else I brought to the table, just the ability to mitigate risks. Because when we're in combat situations, um, the risks we face aren't, you know, losing money. You know, the risks we face are, are counted in lives. And, you know, so, so being able to have that, bring that mindset to the table of number one, we've got to, we've got to fulfill the mission. And number two, we have to mitigate as many of these risks as possible to do it safely really helped out. And why do you think people mostly have the fear when it comes to the money, you know, the fear of losing? I think it's mostly because of lack of knowledge, but I wanted to hear from you, your perspective, you know, what is the fear? Why people are so attached to the money because they don't trust other people with money. So what is your thought process with that? I have read somewhere and I I really like the, the psychology books about how our mind works, but I read somewhere that we are seven times more adverse to losing than, than we are, or, or we, we will, we are seven, the number was seven, but, you know, just, just our, our psychology, you know, if, if you look at what's, what's more scary to our mind, you know, losing a hundred dollars is seven times more scary as the benefit of gaining a hundred. You know, so mm-hmm. I think just as humans, we look at, you know, loss as a big risk and it, it's something that is just natural to us. But, you know, for me, it was, it was a long time coming, you know, a lot of it was rich dad, poor dad, and a lot of it was realizing that um, if I didn't, if I didn't expose myself to more risks, um, I wouldn't make it any further than I, I currently had. Right. So um, you know, that, that first property, I wrote a $40,000 check, earnest money. I wired it, but I wired $40,000 out of my checking account to cover that earnest money. And, you know, it was at the time, the largest single check that I've written. And at the time, I said, yeah, anyway, at the time, yeah, I said that right. At the time it was the largest check that I had written. Um, and it was a little bit nerve wracking. You know, I, I, I knew that I needed to do it, but when it came time to, you know, call the bank and say, I want to make a $40,000 wire, um, you know, it, I, I paused for a bit, you know, and, and I, I ended up just going through the same thing that I, I was talking about is you, you try to mitigate the risk. You look at the reward, you mitigate the risk. And I realized the reward is worth the risk of losing 40,000, you know, worst case scenario, I still have a job you know, and I still have an income that comes in. So yeah, I took the risk. 
That's true. That's average, right? The more the rest, more the reward. So let's look at it. We have a few questions. Uh, there's a question from Glenn. Tell us, how did you meet the other partners of Four Oaks? Um, I met them. Uh, so I met Eric in the Michael Blanc program. Um, he, he wasn't a coaching student, but Michael Blanc has a, a network of, of, you know, pay to play people. Um, it's just a small subscription fee. But uh, I met Eric in that group. And uh, I noticed that he had an area code that's a South Carolina area code. So that's how I met him. He introduced me to Brian. He introduced me to Todd. All right, so let's look at the next question is, what are the names of lenders he used for Freddie Mac programs? Um, so I was talking about Freddie and, and the house I'm in, the, the owner of the house it works. Uh, he's one of the, the founders of, of Sabal. I, I think that's what, what I was mentioning. I, I saw that pop question pop up right after I, I, I said that. So I think you're referring to a Sabal. Okay. Um, Another question, again, from an anonymous attendee. Do you mind sharing the name of the coach and the mastermind group you could join or you joined? Um, the one I joined was, was Michael Blanc. Um, and it, incidentally, you know, we, we are trying to create, you know, something of that nature ourselves. So, um, you know, what, what my focus in the business has been recently is creating an educational platform and community where people can come together. You know, I think, uh, a lot of the communities have really good things about them. Um, you know, we're trying to take what we've learned from the other programs and do something that's just even better. That's good. And uh, there's another question, I think it's from the same person, it's anonymous again. Do you know how much money we need to start the process so we can be better prepared to pay for coaching and to do my first deal? So, I mean, both of them are different and it depends. Um, Coaching programs range, you know, and there, there's there's lots of different educational programs. Um, I would say coaching programs help. They're not 100% necessary, you know. For, for me, I did coaching because I wanted to accelerate. Um, I knew I had three years left before I could retire, and I wanted to create an, a six-figure income. So that's why I did coaching was to accelerate. Um, but really it depends on how big you want to start. You're looking at about a one one to 2% is what you have to put down as earnest money, you know? So in my case, I wrote a $40,000 check on a $4 million purchase price, which is 1%. But, uh, um, you know, the, the, the more you have, the better prepared you're going to be is the answer. There, there's lots of other, um, financial things, hurdles you have to get over besides just cash in the bank too. Right. Um, let me remind everybody again, if you have any questions, please put in the chat box if you are in the live uh, Zoom meeting. And if you're on Facebook or watching us on LinkedIn, YouTube, please uh, put your questions there and I'll ask Brian. So Kevin, you. question, is there anything you would have done differently if you had to do it over again? I would have started earlier. <laughs> I echo that. Well, last but not the least, we do not have any more questions, Brian, but I would love you to share how people can contact you. Uh, Brian Briscoe at fouroakscapital.com.